Um, so uh, that, right, so um, the first thing that I want to do this morning is uh, table material received from the Christchurch uh, Civic Trust and uh, staff, so this is moving on to item seven and back to item seven, um, reconvened from Thursday the 8th of September. Um, on Thursday, we heard deputations relating to item seven, uh, approval to notify plan changes 13 and 14 and officers um, presented to us. Uh, Councillors were then provided an opportunity to ask questions um, of clarification. Uh, staff are going to give us a short presentation um, in a minute and they are going to remind us of our statutory obligations, they're going to cover some of the issues that were raised um, in the material we've just tabled, uh, some of the other legal issues, some of the issues around um, trees and also some of the issues around just the obligations that we have under the Resource Management Act. And I guess just to reflect on where we've got to, the deputations we heard last week have reinforced a lot of the feedback that we have received. Um, and this was feedback, and I just remind councillors on the pre-notification, an approach which was designed specifically to draw our residents' attention to the issues we are required under the Resource Management Act to address. Our residents weren't the only ones to offer feedback. We received government uh, feedback from government departments, from developers, from commercial interests, um, and we also received uh, feedback from those who wanted to see the, um, an increased availability of affordable rental properties and affordable housing within walking distance of transport routes and hubs which actually was the original intention of the MPSUD. There were those who spoke of our climate emergency and the need to intensify where it makes um, sense rather than encouraging more and more urban sprawl. And a lot of reference was made in the feedback that we received to our outer neighbours, but also to the outer reaches of our own city boundaries. The purpose of the feedback was to enable input into what was notified, and as we have heard, we don't have a choice not to notify. We have a statutory obligation to do so. Um, staff made changes to what is proposed to be notified based on the feedback that was received. There seems to have been a misunderstanding um, generated in a, some of the emails that I have seen go backwards and forwards, but there seems to be a misunderstanding that all amendments that were made at that point were councillor amendments. They were not councillor amendments. They are staff analysis of the feedback that they have received from the range of people who offered feedback, not just including residents, but also including government departments, developers, commercial interests, the whole lot. So there's been a consideration of the feedback to go into the proposal that is in front of us today for notification. If councillors want to amend what is notified, then we have had a really open process where councillors have been given opportunities to submit um, amendments. Staff have made themselves available for drop-in sessions People have been able to go and have a chat to staff to talk about all of the issues, you know, and I mean, staff have really gone to the nth degree to make themselves available to support um, the process that we are now um, faced with um, over these last two days. <coughs> so, so that's, so, so the councillors can adopt or reject the um, amendments that we've received and if there is uh, if there are particular recommendations that have come out of the feedback process that councillors uh, don't want to support then that needs to be made explicit and that's what we vote on so um, I, I must admit to a degree of frustration uh, by a series of emails that have made no sense to anyone other than the person submitting them. So, um, after the presentation, we will go through the councillor amendments. 
These councillor amendments were tabled last week, um, and but we'll go through them again. Now I have received advice as to which ones I have to rule out of order because they are not in order. They are not capable of being consider considered by the council today. Um, there are a number, um, uh, a small number in that category. But the vast majority of them are able to be considered by the meeting and uh, whether they are accepted or rejected by the meeting is entirely in your hands. And uh, this is one of these interesting occasions where I sit here as the mayor of the city uh, chairing this meeting and I have no idea what the result of the meeting will ultimately be. So, um, uh, so that's, that's, um, that's I, I guess, not an entirely unusual uh, for me. Um, I have... Um, uh, staff have advice on each of these, so they have uh, considered each of the amendments that have been submitted, but, you know, I was surprised by a last-minute amendment <laughs> last night, so um, that uh, probably my, my reference to Councillor Chu being online. Um, then I will... Um, now, w once we've been through that and questions, I'm actually expecting this initial part to take about half an hour, <clears throat> then I'm going to adjourn this item and go back to the balance of the agenda of the meeting. And the reason for that is that I want to come back to this just before morning tea. Now, as I indicated to councillors by email, I've asked staff if I can move an amendment to provide some limitations on the extent of the MDRS um, as a, by a qualifying matter that relates to an infrastructure constraint while that constraint exists. Now, all will come clear. It's been very difficult to try and formulate this, so um, it's sort of kind of been down to the wire late last night. So if I'm in a position to do so, I want to table an option and then break for morning tea so that there's a half-hour break where people can have a good look at it, they can ask staff questions, and then we'll come back to the item. Um, straight after morning tea. Um, and, and in some respects, uh, you know, it's, it's really been listening to what people have had to say and what the concerns are, but across the breadth and the depth of the issues, um, and not all of those have been covered, <coughs> excuse me, in the deputations that we've heard. So gone back to the feedback that we received um, right across the board. So um, I'm now going to hand over to staff and ask them to uh, give their presentation. It's relatively short. Um, any sort of simple follow-up questions we'll deal with, and then we'll go through the councillor amendments, and then we'll adjourn this item and go on to other items on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Ike and I are uh, uh, presenting a very short uh, PowerPoint. Um, and I have one slide which repeats the legal advice that we gave in the staff report and in the council meeting on <laughs> Thursday of last week. Just three really fundamental points here. Um, the first, um, repeating what you yourself said, Mayor, the council does have a statutory obligation to notify a plan change. It's required by the RMA. It's required by the national policy statement. Councils don't get to pick and choose which laws they implement and which laws they don't. It's the role of the council to perform its statutory obligations. There's a risk if the council doesn't do that, aside from basic risk to rule of law, and that is that the High Court might require the council to do it on application by anyone for an order from the High Court, again, at the cost of the council, or the minister can appoint someone to perform the role that the council hasn't performed. Secondly, there were submissions last week suggesting that the council could or a person could seek judicial review of the parliamentary process by which the RMA was amended last year. The High Court doesn't exercise a judicial review function over Parliament. Parliament is supreme. Um, the parliamentary legislative process is controlled by Parliament. What the High Court does is scrutinise the interpretation and the application of law. For example, the application of the law by this Council. 
the High Court will intervene in that if this council doesn't do it. The High Court doesn't intervene in the parliamentary process by which laws are passed. Um, on top of that, um, this law has been in effect, talking about the amendment to the RMA, um, since the end of last year. There were, are 14 Tier 1 councils. 12 of them have already implemented um, the plan change required by the legislation. The only two that haven't are this council and Waikato, and Waikato is doing so on the 19th of September. It's notifying the plan change. Um, so um, it's underway. The third point, or third, uh, related point, I think, is um, the uh, letter that the Civic Trust sent to the Council yesterday that the Mayor has mentioned, which was suggesting that because of the uh, process for the regulatory impact statement uh, for the amendment legislation last year, there is a further ground for judicial review. I'd just like to remind councillors that regulatory impact statements are produced by government departments to assist ministers, to assist cabinet, and they're taken into account as part of the legislative process by parliament. They're taken into account by the select committee, they're taken into account by submitters when they put in their submissions on the legislation. It's not now a basis to overturn legislation. My final point relates to um, a suggestion last week on Thursday that the council could ask the minister to remove the council from the list of tier one councils for the purpose of the implementation of the NPS and the implementation of the changes to the RMA. Um, the council is identified as a tier one council in both the NPS and in the RMA itself. The 2021 amendment to the RMA listed the tier one councils. This council is one of them. Um, in order to have this council removed as a tier one council, it requires a change to the RMA and a change to the NPS. It's not just a letter to a minister. Uh, the reference to a letter to a minister was uh, solely valid in relation to the notice that the Minister issued earlier this year, which set the end date by which the Tier 1 councils must issue their decisions on the implementation of the NPS. That end date is the 20th of August next year. Um, the Gazette notice said that councils can write to the Minister and seek an extension of that date if they want to. So that's all that that written notice related to, just an extension of that end date. Are there the three key legal points I wanted to emphasise, Ike? I agree. Thanks, Brent. Um, we've been asked to cover off, uh, I guess, a bit of a reminder for some of the financial contributions that uh, we're proposing as part of uh, Plan Change 14. Um, so just to recap, uh, as part of what we're proposing through the financial contributions framework, uh, options are available for people who choose to develop a site, do the retain trees that exist on the site, to plant trees, or in the absence of planting or retaining, pay a financial contribution to council. A typical residential site would require uh, in the order of one to two trees per residential unit, uh, and uh, if um, they weren't planted, the financial contribution would uh, be typically in the order of thirty to $60,000 um, per, uh, per site as well, per new uh, residential site that's created. Uh, the uh, price is related to the size of the site, obviously, with the coverage, but also the valuation of land. The valuation of land is a link um, uh, purposefully made uh, of the intention to plant locally, uh, representing where there may be a loss of uh, canopy uh, within that catchment. It's worthwhile to remind um, uh, uh, council and staff uh, that uh, there is also a financial contribution that would be additional uh, for greenfield development, uh, most notably within the road reserve at 15%. Uh, so the 20% would relate to the residential lots that's created and 15% in terms of the road reserve. By proxy, it would generate uh, tree-lined streets um, uh, if uh, said developer wanted to avoid paying financial contributions. The canopy itself is calculated at 20 years of tree maturity, so um, 
basically you're not required to plant 20% uh, canopy uh, at the time of development. It's taken at what the tree would be at 20 years uh, maturity. Um, and the 20% uh, uh, canopy cover aligns with the MDRS uh, national uh, regulation for medium density residential standards for landscaping. Um, and this protects the integrity of the policy uh, because there is an alignment there in terms of the overall direction for financial contributions uh, and landscape area under MDRS. In terms of the genesis for, I guess, where we find ourselves for intensification uh, around and within centres, uh, just worthwhile to canvas you know, where the NPSUD came from. So in 2016, what was called the MBA, NPSUDC, or uh, Urban Development Capacity, was introduced and identified council as a, as a Tier 1 uh, council uh, at that time. Uh, in 2020, uh, the NPSUD, which is the current piece of regulation, was introduced and the, really the change there was to be far more directive about the location for intensification. Uh, and this was principally focused at having a criteria for where intensification um, ought to be enabled, uh, principally within uh, central city, uh, larger commercial centres around those centres, and areas of uh, high accessibility to public transport, uh, other services, employment, and also housing demand. The NPSUD set a deadline for which uh, those uh, proposals needed to be notified, uh, which was the 20th of August 2022, uh, hence where we find ourselves today. The NPSUD also was the first piece of regulation to introduce uh, qualifying matters uh, and also directed that parking standards must be removed from all district plans um, across the country as well. Uh, in late 2021, the amendment was made to introduce MDRS, or Medium Density Residential Standards, to apply for all Tier 1 councils. Um, this introduced the framework of what's known as the 3x3 three three model, uh, effectively permitting three storeys uh, and up to three units per site as well uh, across all urban residential zones. In a similar vein, qualifying matters, the narrative thereof and the requirements to introduce that was also uh, carried over uh, through MDRS as well. So effectively what that meant is where previously uh, the likes of qualifying matters was only required to be evaluated within those intensification areas directed by the UD within and around those centres, uh, then it was also extended across all of the urban residential area. So uh, vastly increased the, um, I guess, the workload for council to uh, reflect restrictions uh, for urban development. Um, this also adopts the same deadline uh, which was introduced through the NPSUD in terms of uh, giving effect to that intensification direction of the 20th of August 2022. Um, you may say purposefully uh, to ensure that there is a consistency in terms of the overall direction for all Tier 1 councils for their uh, intensification approach. Uh, and in... Um, uh, Later, uh, past that point as well, there was a Gazette notice that was introduced that Brent previously mentioned as well um, from the Minister that set the completion date uh, of the 20th of August next year. So effectively, we have bookends of dates, um, being the date that we must notify our intensification package, if you will, and the date that it must be uh, completed, as in uh, Council must, by that date, uh, deliberate on the recommended decision from the Independent Hearings Panel. Um, I guess that brings us to the end of uh, the uh, planning matters and the legal matters that we wanted to, I guess, remind councillors of. Uh, before we move on, any further questions on those matters that we raised? I think that that's, um, that's, that's pretty clear. I think we should go through the amendments that have been proposed um, with the advice to me on the ruling out. Yanni, did you have a question? I just had one very specific question because... Um, I appreciate that we can't apply for an exemption as a tier one city on well, you know the the question that was raised by just writing to the minister. But what we can just to be really clear, an amendment that would seek a deferment of the plan change and write under section eighty M of the RMA to seek an extension of time frames is perfectly legitimate thing for council to Only do. Only for the end point, they said. Yeah. Yeah. The end date. Right. And that would be really something for the incoming council. So, sorry, just to be clear, my, my understanding in that notice is that it says that it's relevant to um, the timeframes at each of the stages. Yeah, but it's only what the 
it's only what the um, what the order and council specifically states. It's only the end date that it determines. Correct. The Gazette notice gives one direction, and that single direction, a sole direction, and the sole direction it gives is that there must be a council decision following the IHP hearing by the 20th of August next year. So at the end of the notice, it simply paraphrases the section of the RMA that says once the minister has issued a direction, people can write to the minister asking for a change to that direction. So that's solely about the end date of the process. And we did send sorry, you an sorry. email explaining yeah, no, I've had this that email. to you in detail, yeah. Yanni. So, so just looking at 80M, which refers then to 80L, what it says is one or more periods of time within which the specified territorial authority me, must complete one me, or more stages ATL of the ISPP. does not apply to the tier one authorities in this matter. I explained this to you in some detail. No, I don't agree. <coughs> Can you please not hold up the meeting? Um, the issue is explicit, and that is, is that it is only the end date that it refers to with respect to, to <coughs> the tier one council. That's Sorry, well, can we just get that clarified then? Because ADM does say that a specified territorial authority may request in writing that the Minister amend a direction under Section 80L that applies to the territorial authority, setting out the reasons for the request. And if you go to 80L, that sets out a variety of stages through the ISPP process, not just the end date. What it sets out, Councillor, is a variety of stages through the process about which the Minister can issue a direction. And the only one of those about which the Minister has issued a direction is the end date of the process, 20th of August 2023. So that's the only thing the Council can write to the Minister about. The notification date is in the Act, not in the Gazette notice. Tim. Got a copy of the direction. Tim. Uh, thank you. Um, just a few questions I've been asked in the last few days, just to clarify. So any person can apply to the High Court um, for an urgent order directing Council to implement the plan, is that correct? Um, yes, that is correct, Councillor. Yes. So that could be, say, a developer or a developer group wanting us to move if we said no today. They could actually go straight to, the, or they could be ready to go now. That's right. That's what I'm referring to when I uh, referred in my slide to an application to the High Court and the High Court is showing an order. Uh, I would expect that there's a number of developers in the community who are ready to go ahead um, and the delay would be um, causing them loss. And how would that affect the plan as it is as staff have prepared it? The application to the High Court? Yeah, so the, the application to the High Court would <laughs> force us to make the decision. Is that decision on the plan that staff have prepared or as the, the government has ordered? Um, no, the, uh, I would expect that the High Court wouldn't get involved in the merits of the plan yeah. change itself. The yeah. High Court would be controlling the, the process. Something I mentioned before is that the High Court intervenes in relation to the, the interpretation and the application of legislation. So if the High Court on an application by a developer considers yeah. that this council is not applying the legislation, the High Court will direct the council to apply the legislation by notifying the plan change. Thank you. Um, just a couple more, sorry. Um, in the past, we've had a Crown Manager come in, and the Crown Manager, to their integrity and their professionalism, said, I will not take over the Council. I, there is one area that I must look at, and that is what I will be doing, although they could have. So that was their decision, their integrity. So my understanding is, after being asked a number of questions about Crown Managers coming in, etc., is that a Crown Manager could come in and just look at and I, um, the... Um, just perform the duties to notify the plan change. So nothing else but that one specific task. Is that correct? Yes, that is possible. The, the application of an appointee to do the council's role can be under either the Local Government Act, mm. under which it's called a Crown Manager, or it's under Section 25 of the RMA, under which it's just called an appointee. So if the Minister for the Environment um, appoints an appointee under the RMA, the Minister for the Environment will determine the terms of reference for the appointee, and it might be to notify the plan change that staff has prepared, have prepared, or as I warned, as, as a risk last week, the Minister's direction to the, to the appointee could be to 
revisit what staff have prepared, take out character areas, yeah. take out heritage areas, and notify what's left. Yep. So yeah. So in all, so council would have no control of of that once that start process starts. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And um, sorry to hold it, but the final one. The good, very good questions, Tim. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the final. With regards to judicial review, and I know it's between you've gone with regards to government, but the judi could judicial review be taken to council, because and look and review our process and our implementation of. <laughs> my God, I've been going over this for like yeah, half the time you have. I've realised, but but you know that that so looking at the council's process for impl implication and oh. for notification. Yeah. Rather than the government, so could we be yes. facing a judicial review? Yes. yes. So how would that relate to the overall arching from the government? So we we um, we, we get questioned how we have done the process. Yep. Where does that? But there's no change to the process, or, or as in the outline of the process the government has directed. Well, well the government the, the government has directed that the tier one councils um, uh, implement um, this this new urban intensification sort of program. It's a very important part of the government's yes. legislative program, as I understand it. Um, as I said before, twelve of the fourteen tier one councils have already notified it. Yep. Mm. So the ju judicial review looked at if, if someone did take it to council, what would that consist of? Um, so it would be an application. Um, for judicial review of this council's administration of the legislation. Um, so someone will take an application to the High Court saying that um, the council has acted unlawfully and should be directed yes. to act lawfully. Yes. So it's, it'd be quite similar to the process that um, you were asking about before where a developer could seek an order from the High Court that the council simply does its, performs its statutory function. Um, and the High Court on Judicial Review would be considering the same matter. So the, ju the Judicial Review must is only looking at breaches of law. That's correct. Process. A process. Pro process. process. Administrative. Okay. It's yeah. an administrative yes. review, yep. essentially. Yep. Yep. It's judicial Review. Yep. Just to clarify. Thank, thank you very much, Brent. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the Councillor um, oh. Amendments. Oh, sorry, sorry. Jay. Um, Brent, do you have a perspective of how likely it would be that we would get an exemption to the final end date, the gazetting date, given that we're already a month late to notify? Um, no, I ha uh, that's a hard one to answer. I, I haven't got a feel for what approach the minister, that, the, yeah. the minister would take to it. Um, looking at it in context, though, 14 councils, all being directed to notify by the same date, all being directed to have a decision out by the same date. That date is before the next uh, general elections. Um, the, this council um, is already late on the notification because the, the statute required the notification to be by the 20th of August of this year. Mm. Um, there was no formal process to get an extension of time. The council just said to the minister, hey, look, because of COVID and, and resources, we simply can't do it by the 20th of August. So I guess my point is that it's already happened once, plus um, there's the extenuating circumstance of we're already late at this stage, so you'd think you'd want to follow through with, with that at the, at the tail end. Yeah. I, I know what you're saying. You can't answer. That's uh, I can't answer for the minister. <coughs> it, it would be... Um, open to councillors to to seek that, um, but would you advise that that would happen now or that it would happen uh, later in the process? Well, I think it would be too early to seek that um, because the IHP um, needs to determine what process um, it wants to follow and how much time that's going to take. Right, okay. All right, so now we'll move on to the council amendments. Can we get them up on the screen? And as I say, if, if each of the councillors, um, well, perhaps, perhaps if we, um, uh, if each, each of the councillors could indicate uh, a seconder for um, their motion and and just to to state the purpose of the amendment. So we'll start with you, Councillor Coker, proposed amendment number seven. 
Um, second is it Pauline Cotter. Sorry? Second. Pauline Cotter is the seconder. Right. And it's relatively self explanatory. You want me to explain? No, uh, so, for number seven, um, at the moment, um, staff have um, put together a concept of having um, financial contributions required by developers if they do not put trees on sites um, to provide canopy cover in 20 years of 20%, acknowledging that at the moment no trees at all are required, um, and I'm seeking to increase that to 25%, so that way we can either have more tree canopy coverage or more money out of developers. Okay, and the um, 8A, um which is, uh, oh, hang on. So just um, in terms of the staff um, recommendation or the staff advice on that one is that, uh, that that's not supported by staff um, but simply because of the um, relationship to the MDRS and the 20% coverage for landscape. Right, so, um, and the second one, it's got Councillor um, Coker, oh, right, <laughs> yeah, I saw it was wrong, but um, I think Councillor uh, Cotter is seconding the second um, one of these, which is supported by staff. Is that right? Yep. Right, and then we move to um, the next one, uh, Councillor Cotter. Just identify. Just, just. Can you just summarise the amendment and and um, and notif and advise the seconder? Okay, there's no yep. Buttons playing up. It's uh, overused. Um, so requesting staff to investigate and support adding cottages 62, 64, 74, and 76 Chancellor Street to the schedule of heritage items. Um, and noting too that just in there. Number 72 is already heritage listed, so that's a, a really nice little block of um, old cottages uh, on Chancellor Street. Um, and I think the second of that is Jake McClellan. Right. And this is supported. Yes. All right. And then um, the next one is Woodfall Street, which is yep. yours as well. Yep, also supported. And uh, Councillor McClellan's seconding that. Yep. And then we move to Councillor McClellan. So, the yeah, this is um, this is to include all of Chester Street East as part of the heritage area at this stage. Um, so this is the safe and cautious option, in, in my view. We've heard from staff that a more in-depth analysis is required and there's still questions around the considerations with the advice provided by the heritage consultant. So including the full street at this stage allows protection in the meantime so more heritage isn't lost while the merits or otherwise of the whole street is determined during the remainder of the process. Okay, and um, who's the seconder for that, Jake? Councillor Cotter. Councillor Cotter, thank you. Uh, oh, then we're back to Councillor Cotter for... Yep, yeah, this was a late one that came in from the residents down there, just wanting the southern, uh, southern end of Mersey Street included as a, a residential character area. Um, and this one is supported by staff and seconded by Councillor McClellan. Right. Okay. And then the next one is Councillor McClellan. So this one is seconded by Councillor Cotter. Um, and the amendment enables a consistent six storeys across the, the neighbourhood it refers to. Currently you have a situation where you have half of this very small residential area at 32 metres and the other half is 20. The whole street, the whole area is very similar and it would create a smoother transition to min and maintain similarity across these four residential streets before you move into the transitional 10 storey zone where the casino is, or well, where the casino has empty land before you reach the 90 metre city core. Okay, and um, that's not supported by staff um, and they have an alternative um, resolution for investigation of the matters that should the amendment fail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Councillor Johansson. Um, this, this was similar to the Chester Street one um, that Councillor McClellan put up. Um, 
but it was really just aiming for the area um, from Tankard Street back to, um, sorry, from, from Patton Street back to Linwood Ave. Yeah, we haven't got um, specific dates. I think staff assisted with the phrasing properties of a consistent age yeah. in order to not do it on yeah. either side. And, so, okay. Yeah. Second. All right. Who's your seconder? Um, sorry, I don't have don't have one. One second. Yeah. Um, Melanie. Cool. Melanie Coker. Thank you. Sorry, I did ask councillors to get seconders for this purpose. Um, Councillor Johansson, next one. This was the heritage items that people had raised. Um, yeah, but uh, I think. How many heritage items are in this resolution? Staff will have that. No, Yanni, this is this is a significant alteration. Was there? Yeah, wasn't there one that you wanted to notify? Um, well, the Upper Rickerton War Library and Princess Margaret Hospital are the two. But happy just to do the Upper Rickerton Library. It's a shame, Jimmy. Um, wasn't here. But. Cool. But well, that's cool. No one wants to second it. So, yep, it's okay. Sorry, so you want to just put one item on there now? Well, the upper record and war library would, would be one that I would put forward. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm just, I'm a little confused as to the, um, so when, when I proposed this, there weren't the reference to the other heritage sites, but now they have been through the amendments. There's a number of other amendments that people are putting forward on, on some of the heritage that were raised by people. This one doesn't currently have a listing, so there is no information to back up adding it like this. The staff did a heritage assessment, as I understand it. Is that correct? And it would qualify. Can we can, can we turn this into an investigate? Sure. Because I would hate yeah. to <coughs> hold up yeah, the fine. entire process. Okay. Cool. Adding the Upper Rickerton War Library. But can I just be clear? Have staff already done a heritage assessment on it? As far as I'm aware, um, none of the lists that has been uh, has been provided. It was in the previous meetings uh, have been fully investigated, so this is why staff do not support the amendment. Right. Okay. Mayor, the alternative resolution um, that the councillor um, might have some comfort from would be one that requires the council to investigate um, the merits, uh, requires staff to investigate the merits of, of listing that building. And, Right, but people raised this through the pre-notification period that they wanted it listed, mm. right? And I thought, sorry, apologies, okay, I thought I'm we'd done work around that. I'm also aware that there's been other decisions taken by this council in relation to this matter, and there is um, additional work that, that is going to be required to be done. So... Um, yep. Let's go, cool. just leave it. Okay, so um, the next one is... Oh, who's the seconder for that one? No, who's the seconder for the Rickerton War Library? Uh, it is not an evacuation. <laughs> Yanni, who seconded the Rickerton? I don't, I don't have a seconder. So if no one wants to second it, oh, okay. Aaron will second it. Yeah. I mean, it's going to happen anyway. Like having it investigate, people put it forward. So it's already going to happen. It's not actually, and, and similar for the next one with flooding access. Well, I did have one question. Of the next one is supported by staff. So yeah. who's the seconder? Second. Uh, Pauline, thank but you. I, but I just wanted to clarify with staff because I'm like a bit like your infrastructure one. I'm just a little bit concerned that in the meantime, people could put intensive development along the flood zone. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
think I'll have one of those buttons up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah. No, no, I, I, but the concern is that in the meantime, people could develop in that area where we've spent money buying out flood-affected properties. And I just, uh, so I'm, I just wanted to... High flood management areas are, are already um, uh, got uh, challenges around them. So you're talking about access to properties. This, yeah, is, so not, this is not about... The, the high flood management areas because that's already in the qualifying matters. But if, if you look at the areas along the river, directly adjacent to the river where you get flooding that affects access, enabling higher density development without any off-street car parking. Can you, look, so, Yanni, you know that those areas alongside the river are already in the high um, flood qualifying matters. They're already well, qualifying matters. So you're talking about um, flood risks yeah. on access to properties. These are the business areas um, and other areas where no, 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 roads that, flood. Okay, that, sorry. That I, I tried to. I mean, I met with staff to try and work this through. My concern was specifically around the areas adjacent to the river corridor, where we get flooding that restricts and prevents access, and where people have to move their vehicles. And we've seen a number of flooded vehicles. I just wanted to understand if there was any qualifying matter. That would, you know, consider the impact if something was proposed uh, to be could you developed. Respond to that? That's all. There's a threshold, obviously, that needs to be met for any qualifying matter, uh, and the threshold in, in something like this is significant natural hazard risk, which is was quite a high bar. Um, this is why the staff have recommended to amend, I guess, the original uh, proposal to investigate, um, because it's there needs to be an evidence basis to justify simply access rather than the impact on a site. Um, as mentioned, there are a number of flooding layers that have already been captured as qualifying matters, including coastal inundation, uh, high flood risk areas, uh, water body setbacks, as well as ponding okay. areas. So there's quite a number but of flooding layers. But you think layers. there's protection there already? This would just look at another layer based on access? Yes, which okay. is quite a lot of different analysis that's required in terms of access conf configuration, network analysis, so on and so forth. So it's simply not a matter of, uh, on a whim, we can decide a qualified matter that needs to be an evidence basis there. So we support the investigation thereof, but not um, simply adding it as part of an existing qualified matter as part of the proposal. I met with staff and looked at the maps along, say, like Clarendon Terrace, is could you build the intensive housing that this enables? And it looked like you could. The flooding areas along that particular area um, uh, restrict development on those areas where there would be inundation uh, along the front of the properties. Uh, it does leave that there are some sites at the rear of those properties that is outside of the high flood risk area uh, where uh, development could proceed. Um, uh, so again, it protects the areas where there is inundation. It doesn't yet conceptualise access to those properties. Just, just to summarise that, the Resolution 16, as worded on the screen, is supported by staff. Staff have no issue with it. <coughs> it's saying you want an investigation, and staff are saying, yes, let's investigate it. Yani, the protection of the qualifying matter is a one-year protection. Because if the qualifying matter goes in, then it will um, it will be protected thereafter. So it's only the 12-month period between now and the, um, and the formal decision. So um, the next one is the um, effects from industrial zones. And again, that's supported by staff. So who's the seconder for that? Jake, Jake McLaren. No, no, that's fine. The only other thing I wanted to clarify with staff, when I've read through the plan change, I see that we are making a number of changes to industrial zoning, but I was sort of under the impression that we couldn't do that. But there's things around commercial centres that are being changed, there's things around um, hospitals that are being changed. So I, I was just, like, initially the idea was to put some protection or some changes to the industrial zones to, so that that was more compatible with residential but I was told that sort of wasn't able to be happened. It was out of scope, and I don't quite understand when we're making those other changes, why, why that's out of scope but the other ones aren't.
Sure. So the direction on the MPSUD is to intensify in area, any areas that are within those walkable catchments, uh, and that is any building density or height. Uh, and it's not just limited to residential or commercial or otherwise. And that's why you see changes to the likes of hospitals, schools. There are numerous schools that will be uplifted, so on and so forth, when they are within those uh, intensification catchments, if you will, from centres. And so that's why we have a brownfield overlay that has been inserted for a number of uh, uh, industrial sites uh, around those walking catchments uh, and that is why we see the likes of uh, uh, the Sydenham area being proposed to change to mixed use zone as well which is currently industrial zoned. And uh, um, yeah uh, Tim? Sorry just to go back to 16 when you were looking at that when we, when I was on the hearings panel with regards to high flood hazard, high flood hazard management areas the, the QC and the specialist planner from Wellington did mention about in a flood getting in a flood event getting access to properties through with an um, emergency, say a heart attack or something like for emergency services. So could you include, look at that when you are investigating, because I'd be in, interested in the feedback on that. It could be part of what we consider. Again, the lens that uh, which is applied through qualify matters is very prescriptive, yep. um, and so it doesn't uh, provide as much flexibility as um, what it may appear. And so once again, yeah. it's about significant natural hazard risk. Um, some of those other things are tangential to that, um, but certainly part of what we will look at part of the investigation. I, th I think the, the reference to an investigator is uh, reflecting that there's further work to be done to identify the extent of areas where access is affected by flood risk. Yeah. Um, there's a range of factors that influence whether access is impeded, including the depth of flood water, <laughs> the time that the flood water is present and until it recedes the time available to people to evacuate or to get suppliers to isolate at home. So, um, And it's not limited to areas along the Heathcote River. It affects, for instance, the Port Hills with reliance on Main Road and, Red Cl and Redcliffs for access mm. from coastal hazards. And our advice is that we investigate it further, but it does require a comprehensive approach that looks at all areas, not just those identified. Um, and uh, Sarah Templeton's the next one. Do you have a seconder for that? Yep, Mike Davidson. Mike Davidson. Yep. And Councillor Chu, who's, um, could you run through your recommendation and I get a speaker. name a seconder? Um, oh, yeah. Um, so the first one was one of the late ones that we received from the Regents Association group. It's been split into two. One's been supported by staff um, and one they um, said they needed to do some more investigation. Sorry, so sorry, I've only got one in front of me. What's the other one? Oh, there should be two. There is um, a staff amendment that's been put forward in the re resolution. Oh, okay. oh, that's resolution one, isn't it? Yeah, no, we've, we've, we've incorporated the staff requested amendment um, into the main resolution. Um, so this one, it's just to extend the Rickard and Bush interface zone. So the one that's been incorporated was for the um, 11C Tory Street, and this one here is for the east um, side of Kahu Road from 17 Kahu Road right through to the north side of Christchurch Boys High School. Um, it's just for consistency reasons, because the sites on the south side of um, Chokoku Street have been included as well, so we're hoping it would be supported. but. That, that one. Sorry. Councillor Sam McDonald would take it. Right. Okay. So that's seconded by Sam McDonald. I'm, I'm still not absolutely clear where it's intended to cover. Oh, okay. So it's um, specifically 117, it's on the resolution there, 19A, 21, 23, 27, 29, and 31 Kaku Road. So it's only those properties? Yeah. Okay. All right, and um, staff are not supporting that because it's not yet researched and analysed, is that? That's correct, and uh, people are freely able to make a submission in support of that, and we would have to consider that as part of the formal process. Right. Okay, um, so there are all the resolutions, and as I say, I'm just going to adjourn this item so that we can um, come back to it. But as I say, I've got... I've got um, uh, an additional one, but I kind of want to get people focusing on the other items on the agenda for the council meeting. We'll come back to it before morning tea and then we'll break for half an hour. I haven't 
scheduled a time for that, but we'll see how progress goes. So can I just again thank staff for the incredible amount of time and effort that they've put into this, um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to the item um, uh, after morning tea. Thank you very much. Thank you. So no, be before we break for um, morning tea, um, I would like to um, to present uh, an amendment on the um, district plan um, resolution, um, and it, it is, um, and I think I think we've got some maps might be might be better than this, but anyway, that, well, I'll just run through it. What, what I've tried to do is to, and it's listening to what people are saying, I mean, and it is also based on the fact that we are obliged to notify um, a plan change, and if we don't notify a plan change, I don't think we should underestimate mm -hmm. the fact that the, the government will appoint somebody who will, and the government's appointee will not feel um, constrained by the advice of our council staff. So, um, so this is not supported by council staff because it doesn't have sufficient information to back it up, um, and this would require um, council uh, staff to to gain that. Um, I just wonder whether the map is a better image than um, than words. And what, I, what I've tried to do is to make sense of um, intensification um, requirements by essentially highlighting the areas, well, a constraint. The constraint is, is that these are areas where there is not a bus route in, in um, easy walking distance from people's homes. And so if you create intensification in those areas where there, I mean, already all over the city, there is no requirement for off-street car parking. But if you require um, or enable intensification in all of the areas, um, then it does create uh, an issue around um, protecting some of the things that we particularly uh, value and um, that's just looking at the fact that we are a large urban flat area um, we don't have natural gullies like Auckland and Wellington we don't have um, uh, we don't we, 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 we can't strip all of our properties of all trees and then not make make good um, somewhere else so so this, what this would do would be allow for um, intensification to be limited to within one kilometre of the five main bus routes, which aligns to PT Futures, um, a staged approach to greater intensification, which is, while the constraint exists, you can't intensify in these areas, um, and then limiting the MDR, yes, and using this qualifying matter to prevent it being used more widely. Would this would this stand up um, to the uh, to the propose to the um, process? Um, you know, at this stage, I guess the advice from council staff is no that it wouldn't, because there isn't the balance, there isn't the reporting that sits behind it to support it. But what it, because it's instead of having a blanket provision and allowing the MDRS across the city, this would um, have a public transport accessibility zone or a qualifying matter applying in those areas where, where ultimately over time there may be um, public transport made available, but it isn't available now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Um, uh, Print this out, and um, and but let let councillors have a look at this over um, over the because I'm going to allow her um, till ten thirty, uh, uh, sorry eleven thirty for our break, um, and then um, and then we can we can come back 
or is half an hour enough? Half an hour might be enough. And, um, and then we can come back and we can move back onto the agenda. Um, but, I mean, I don't know whether councillors will um, uh, support it or not. And, I mean, it's been very difficult to try and come up with something that's, that, in my view, could be justified um, in relation to what a qualifying matter might be um, uh, on top of the amendments that councillors have already um, moved. So um, I didn't really want to take questions on it now because I just wanted us to have an opportunity to talk informally. It would be good to have alternate wording that had the investigate one rather than the straight away for qualified amendment, like we have with other amendments. We've had an investigate and submit yeah. um, option for wording. Um, the other thing is that um, we need to acknowledge that some areas of the city are currently underserviced by public transport, but that there's no actual infrastructure needed to do that. You just need to put more buses on, and those areas should be serviced by public transport. So instead of stopping development, we could be asking Eken to put on the buses and then everyone would be better served. Just saying. Yeah. I'd like to see the, the, the your amendment before you ask any yeah, questions. Yeah, so, um, all right. So I will um, adjourn the meeting um, until quarter past 11 and um, and staff who've, who've assisted with the map um, and some of the wording for me will be available out in the, out behind if, if people... Okay, all right. We'll come back at 11.30. These that kind of have come up over the break. So I'll deal with the first one. The first one is that I asked a question of staff, which I completely forgot to ask at any other time, which was um, if we notified uh, a um, plan change which did not comply with our obligations um, under the RMA, in relation to this matter, um, could the minister um, intervene and get someone else to notify correctly uh, a um, plan change that would be in full compliance with the um, RMA? And the answer to that question was yes. Um, and I had not contemplated that because the whole purpose for looking for solutions as other councillors have with their amendments, has been to look for ways of um, getting the most that we possibly can out of pushing back as far as we can against um, the one-size-fits-all approach that has been imposed um, on us. And uh, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about whether that's uh, whether um, it would be it could possibly be any worse if the government appointed someone to uh, to notify on behalf of the council. And the answer to that question is also quite clearly yes, it could be much worse. And the qualifying matters mm. that we have worked on um, and also received feedback on uh, could be substantially minimised by, um, by uh, a requirement with the terms of reference imposed on someone to um, to do that. So as a result, I have um, moved back to uh, what we've done with a number of the other resolutions, which is to staff investigate making a submission um, to limit the extent of the area. So um, the map um, would make sense in the context of the, of the staff uh, preparing a submission to limit the extent of the an area enabled for medium des density development, but it does not um, limit it at the front end of the notification. Uh, and I know that councillors have raised this question of uh, the MDRS applying um, uh, sort of instantaneously with uh, notification and the subsequent, um, uh, uh, and and but but except for the extent that's covered by a qualifying matter, um, but the protection is really only for twelve months in that respect because the qualifying matter wouldn't have to be confirmed 
um, and under the circumstances that that could be at risk by the by the government simply imposing an alternative um, notification. So I'm I'm quite happy to turn that into that. In terms of getting a resolution onto the table, I'd like to um, move the um, the staff recommendations, um, and I'm I'm. If I have a seconder for the staff recommendations, then I'm happy to include within that the uh, all of the ones that have been all of the amendments that have been moved, but which um, are supported by staff. So all of these other ones that um, investigate um, all of these different areas. So I'd be happy to to do those in bulk and then uh, we'll deal with the individual submissions that councillors um, have moved in addition to that. So um, do I have a seconder for the proposal to notify? So Sarah Templeton. So we've got a resolution on the table um, and that covers all of the uh, recommendations, um, including these um, additional elements that uh, councillors um, originally proposed by way of amendment, and that leaves a number of individual um, uh, amendments. Now, before I, I go on to that, so there's a th so that was one issue that I just wanted to clarify with um, with councillors. So, are there any questions about that? So, right. yeah. just to be clear, so your map isn't being adopted now, the recommendations? No, not adopted at the front end, but um, again, it's like some of the other recommendations that have come through. And look, that on the face of it, if we were to adopt that, it would be um, insufficient to meet our obligations under the RMA. So by um, asking staff to um, uh, investigate making a submission to limit the extent of the area and then picking up all of these issues, I have added an additional um, request, actually, thank you for reminding me, um, request that ECAN undertake an urgent review of public transport in light of the requirement to notify Plan Change 14, and that way that's a signal to the regional council, which is responsible in the area, um, to actually recognise that it needs to do some work starting pronto not just in relation to the areas that are underserved by public transport, but actually the areas that will um, will be imposed on, as it were, by um, by uh, the increased um, amount of um, travel through their through their districts, as we've already seen with the Northern Corridor and the downstream impacts um, on the St Albans community. The thing I wanted to ask of staff was that given that my amendment's been ruled out of order around deferring um, and also on writing to the minister seeking an extension of the time frames, I just wanted to be clear that that doesn't limit an amendment that we do write to the minister raising concerns. Staff? So long as it doesn't include deferring the plan change and um, uh, and using the sections that were identified in the Gazette. Brent, can, can you help? Can you repeat the question, please, Council? Sorry, so the amendments that I've put forward around deferring, um, so just the, um, deferring a decision to notify um, and um, writing to the Minister um, around the, the, the Gazette notice to extend the timeframes, I've been told it's been ruled, ruled out of order. So, that doesn't preclude us from having an amendment or from me putting forward an amendment that would still write to the minister as long as I don't reference deferring the notification decision. Correct. So long as the council is performing its statutory functions, they can write whatever it wants to the minister. Right. Okay. Right. So, so we, we could... Right to the minister. Is that what you said? Sorry. Yes, and and and, and this is something you, you you said as well, Mayor, on Thursday that you had no doubt the council would be writing a letter to the minister expressing some disquiet about this process. Yeah.
Yep. It's the mover and seconder are quite happy for that to be included. Oh, cool. I'll send you the yep. wording then. Great. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, right. Now I'm literally at a loss as to what to do. So um, I've, I've received some advice um, during the break um, and sought to confirm that advice um, uh, with uh, the councillor. Um, I, I just don't know how to do this. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I was kind of expecting something to happen and it's not going to happen. So I don't know how to, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just, a, yeah, I mean, I, I look, I, I just actually want to take a little bit of advice on it because I've been, I mean, I've been surprised by, by the, um, one, the approach, and two, surprised then by what I was told was going to be the response and, and isn't. So I'd like to take a little bit of time to sort that out in my own mind. So what I would like is um, for the Deputy Mayor to take over the chairing of the, um, uh, of the meeting and deal with the other two items that are on the agenda. And if... if um, yeah, and I will come back as quickly as I possibly can, but I am going to take the Chief Executive and the Legal Advisor with me. <laughs> right, we'll return to the um, item number seven. So, um, and I do apologise for um, taking some time, but it's always difficult when people raise issues uh, that could impact on our decision-making ability. So I hope to take advice. Um, uh, and it, it's in relation to um, uh, Councillor Phil Major, and I'm going to give Councillor Phil Major an opportunity to respond to it. So uh, I think that a number of us had been aware of concerns re the ownership of property within the airport contours and conflicts that often um, arise in relation to the airport contours. However, I received advice on this the other day, um, and it was not asked for by me, it was um, provided to me that there was no conflict of interest in respect of that property, um, but I'm doing this for the sake of completeness because it was raised with me, not asked for by me um, the other day, um, last Thursday, how it is zoned rural and therefore it is not affected by the proposals that we have in front of us today. So that was that was dealt with on Thursday. It wasn't raised at the council meeting. Um, it was raised with me um, by uh, council staff, the legal advice, um, and uh, and I simply noted to myself that there was no conflict of interest, it, it wasn't an issue. But because of the next element, I really wanted to make sure that I took a belt, belt and braces approach by telling you everything that I have been told. And this is not because I asked for the information, it is because I was provided with it. So when I came back from the break, um, I was told that advice had been given to Councillor Major that he should reflect on his participation in this item for two reasons. One was the potential for predetermination, having declared before the meeting his intention to vote against the staff recommendations we would be considering today. And the second was the release of donations made to his mayoral campaign um, has raised the perception of potential bias as donations have been made by developers. Um, I was advised that uh, Councillor Major would reflect on that and that he would advise the meeting um, of uh, his intention in that regard. Um, and that's what I was simply trying to clarify with him before the meeting. So I will now hand so over. So is there an opportunity for questions of the legal team? No. I, I'm so going has he been an has no, he been an opportunity there will be for no Phil. discussion about this at all. I'm going to invite Councillor Major. So this has been put on Phil I am now going to in a public ask, meeting. He knows this. I'm going to ask Councillor Major. So the lawyers have talked out the back. Excuse bag me. Excuse me. Order. Could this you is please outrageous. 
Excuse me. I'm going to have to ask you to leave Councillor Macdonald if well, you I will don't, if this proceeds. If you don't behave yourself. I have asked you to give Councillor Major a moment to respond as he is prepared to do because I made sure that he knew what was happening and he will provide the meeting with his response and then we will move on and no debate will be entered into by anyone in relation to this matter. Councillor Major. Thank you, Leanne, and thank you for clearing up the um, airport contour stuff from last week. That's very good. Um, it has been brought to my attention at 11 o'clock this morning that some other councillors have complained that I have a perceived bias on this matter that we're talking about at the moment. Because I was transparent and published some of my donors um, to, that have donated to my campaign, the legal team have advised, advised me to withdraw, but if I did this, I'd never be able to vote on anything again. This plan change is important for the future of Christchurch, and I'm going to continue. This is an Auckland and Wellington problem that has been forced on us by, forced on Christchurch, and we need to stand up for ourselves. Thank you. So now we'll move on to the um, item of business. Um, and, and perhaps it's probably a good idea just to clarify for people that when people are asked uh, to reflect on whether there is a perception or a conflict of interest in any way, shape or form, it is up to the individual councillor to make that call, not, um, not the mayor or not the chair of um, uh, the meeting. Um, right, so I will now move on to the actual um, uh, notification, and it's been moved and seconded. And uh, so now we'll just, um, uh, it's probably, um, it's probably um, appropriate that we just uh, move on to um, the debate and we'll do the, uh, we'll do the amendments, um, we'll vote on them individually, but we can um, deal with the amendments um, as we go through. So, um, so just moving on to the on to the debate itself, I don't think that uh, anyone is entirely happy uh, with the way that this has uh, has transpired. Local government, unfortunately, though, in this respect, is a creature of statute. We don't have a general power of confidence. We can competence. We can only do what statute allows, and we must do what we are directed by statute to do. And in this particular instance, we are required by the Resource Management Act uh, to notify um, changes that give effect to the intensification provisions that were put in place uh, last year. And uh, this council took uh, a different course of action from the course of action that we would normally take. Uh, we actually went out with a pre-notification and as a result of the pre-notification, we received considerable feedback uh, from our residents. We received feedback, as I said before, from government departments. We received feedback from developers. A whole range of people have actually indicated to us that they, um, that they have a specific interest in different elements uh, contained within this plan change. Um, and I'm referencing Plan Change 14, of course, Plan Change 13 as part of our um, approval for public notification as well. The, um, the issues around that, that, that I have looked at, and um, I guess that I was disappointed in, in many respects that I couldn't go straight to um, adding an additional qualifying matter which reflected the priorities that you would apply to intensification. Um, but that's because uh, there is a distinct possibility that the minister would intervene and uh, notify a plan change that was far more um, restrictive and not taking into account the qualifying matters uh, that we have worked, um, worked hard on. There are a number of amendments that councillors have uh, put through, and those amendments, um, I think, will enable the, uh, the organisation to really focus its submission on a range of areas 
uh, that will, um, I believe, improve the process um, as we go. Unfortunately, um, as I said, there was a decision taken by uh, uh, central government, hand in glove with the opposition, to notify um, or to change the law requiring us to notify these elements, um, the medium density residential zone across the city. And I think that the, um, the difficulty that we've been placed in as a city is that uh, we have no alternative other than to notify a plan change. If we don't notify the plan change, then the, the minister will appoint somebody who will. Um, I know that there are many people who out there feel like it can't be worse, but I can assure you that it can be worse because the significant number of um, uh, elements of the qualifying matters that have been put in place uh, that we are considering today uh, are at risk if, in fact, it was simply to meet the obligations set by, by central government. Um, I recall when I presented the submission uh, completely opposing this um, imposition um, on our city of a one-size-fits-all Auckland um, solution, really, for the rest of the country. But Auckland and Wellington, we simply are a flat city. The, the issues here are quite different than what they are in other parts of the country. I made this point over and over and over again. I have repeated it to ministers. I have repeated it to the Ministry for the Environment. They seem to be blithely unaware of all of the changes that were imposed on our city as a result of the earthquakes um, and the significant differences between our district plan and the district plans of both Auckland and Wellington. So, but we are where we are, and um, we are required uh, by law to notify um, a plan change in accordance with the RMA, and uh, that's what I'm proposing that we do today. No one else? Tim? Um, thank you. Look, I'm really disappointed that the, ca that the um, government's done this to us. There's no question to that. I want to thank our staff. They've done an outstanding job, and it is under a lot of pressure. We all are. And it's, appalling, and it's an appalling piece of legislation, let's be honest, to allow any person can apply to the High Court for an urgent order to direct council to implement the plan if we choose not to. That is any individual or organisation. The Minister could appoint a Crown Manager and... Previous governments have. We had one here, and to their integrity and credit, they came in and they looked at only one piece of this council's function, and they worked on that. They could have taken over the council, but to their credit, they concentrated on one piece. This could happen again, because it's, it's happened once before. So the minister could appoint a crown manager to just perform the duties to notify the plan change. If that happened... Council would then have no control over the content of the notified plan. Um, I'm the council of the Kashmir Ward, which by area has the largest character areas in the city. And I am truly worried for my communities. The minister <laughs> has said of the Auckland, uh, Auckland plan, Auckland's character areas are too, too restrictive and may be looked at reviewed. So that's from the Minister. The only Crown entity to, co to comment on the Council's proposal is Kayanga Ora, which has stated, Kayanga Ora does not support either character areas or heritage areas as legit legitimate qualifying matters. Kayanga Ora is opposed to the use of character areas which reduce density below the level provided by the MDRS. Nowhere in this legislation do, does it take into account the social impact and the mental welfare of our communities that have been through so much since the earthquakes and everything else. So although it is not popular, my concern is for my community and those in it, and I believe it is better to have some kind of control than none at all. 
So I will be supporting the council staff today. Aaron? Yeah, we had a lot of submissions last week, people asking us to vote no. Um, and I think Leanne's made it pretty uh, clear from her position, and she spent a bit of time in Parliament, why we should be going along with the staff recommendation. But uh, this um, council stood up to three waters and unanimously said no. And uh, when your public come out like they have and say no to something, sometimes you've got to go with the public, even if it means you might get a bit of a whipping at the back end. That's life. Uh, that's how it goes sometimes. And uh, I will go with the public on this one uh, and back what they say. I wish I was going to be sitting at a council table that unanimously said no to Wellington because I think in recent times Wellington's made a ton of mistakes. The restructure of the politics, the restructure of health, the taking over of three waters, shall we carry on? And just when it comes to intensification, I don't think this country has got the social infrastructure for intensification. We don't have the right social fabric to put a whole lot of people who aren't going that well in life in the same neighbourhood in intensified housing. It just doesn't work. Most of the world call it ghettos, and we're about to create a whole lot. And it's not smart planning, and it's not a way forward, and it's not a socially acceptable way forward. So on behalf of those people that will be living in the boxes next to people they don't like, and we know the outcomes of that, um, on their behalf and on behalf of people that own properties that don't want to live in the shadows of the ghettos, uh, I'll vote for them. Um, Pauline. Thank you. Look, I'm, I'm questioning whether the extent of the enabling of the intensification is appropriate for Christchurch or whether we need these drastic changes right now. And I don't want to expand on all the reasons because the submitters have done such an incredibly brilliant job, well-informed, passionate and clear in their messaging. The rationale for a one-size-fits-all seems to be to increase supply and together with an assumption that there will be a direct correlation with affordability. There's also an assumption that councils have too many regulatory barriers to housing intensification. And yet we know there have been almost 5,000 dwellings consented in the past year in Christchurch, and that these tiny cramped boxes with no gardens are selling for 600,000 to 700,000 plus. So I'd hardly call that affordable. So that correlation doesn't seem to be working in my view. And there's also a concern that we're reaching housing capacity in the next year. In the light of these observations, I'm saying Christchurch doesn't need this. We risk costing our existing residents a loss of sunlight, privacy and general well-being, as well as reducing the attractiveness and amenity of neighbourhoods. Yes, there is a risk in not notifying, and this is a risk that submitters have clearly stated they fully understand and still choose that way forward. Today I'll be voting against notifying as a statement to government <laughs> as a statement to government that this is the only way I can emphasize my dissatisfaction on behalf of the residents of Christchurch. And there are very sound reasons for intensification. We need more houses. We need to protect our valuable growing land from urban sprawl. We need to reduce the need for people to use cars by building homes near transport um, hubs and key activity centres. Well, whilst PC14 is designed to achieve these, it is my view and the view of submitters we have heard from that it will be at the expense of the amenity, character, environment and quality of life of this city and its residents. The dilemma we face is that by voting against notifying, we risk handing over the process to others, that we lose the opportunity to work with the government to get the best outcomes for our city, ideally collaborating with them. However, I find myself thinking back to what we have been through with the chlorination issue. There are similarities. I had hoped that by agreeing to the advice from the Ministry of Health to add, and to add chlorine to our water and to work with them collaboratively, that um, we would come to a good result. 
almost six years later, involving hours and hours of work by staff and elected members and millions of dollars, we still have chlorine in the water. The government has continually moved the goalpost, making it almost impossible to meet the requirements to remove chlorine from our water. And I am fearful that we will have a similar experience here. Despite the goodwill we bring to this, our voice will not be either respected or listened to. So given my lack of trust and confidence in this government over this, I am prepared to take the risk of voting no to notify. <laughs> as, as I believe that the greater risk is to vote yes and to live in a city monstered by this poor policy that, will, that this council has very little control over anyway. Uh, Sam? Um, look, just really briefly, I agree with the sentiment shared by both Anne and Aaron, and the only thing I wanted to add, I don't want to re repeat things, was that uh, earlier this year we had a public meeting in Avonhead where over 400 people showed up uh, of their own accord to engage in local democracy and to share their views. Uh, the biggest theme, and I've got the letter here that they wrote through to government, and I will you know, put, I would be remiss of me not to say I'm equally as disappointed in the National Party as I am the Labour Party. I thought, uh, for this, I genuinely think they have let the city down, and so I don't want it to be this to be seen as a political thing at all, because I'm equally as disappointed in both. But I just wanted to read two paragraphs they sent through uh, to, uh, to to Wellington, which effectively said Christchurch is known as the garden city. Most suburban houses have a front garden, and several suburbs have low density housing. Under the new law, Christchurch will lose its unique character and risk becoming a concrete jungle. I think no truer words could be said. The second one, and, and the one that I agree with most, is that when people bought their houses, they bought into suburbs knowing the intensification rules within them. Uh, to have this lack of consultation by central government, uh, to have it rushed on everyone, and to ultimately change the fabric of the city is not right. So, look, I agree with both Anne and Aaron. There is an inherent distrust there. Um, but equally, I think we need to take a civic, le or Anne Pauline, a civic leadership uh, role and say, actually, we've had enough of Wellington. Uh, we need to take local ownership of this stuff, and I think the only way we can do that is oppose this. Thank you. Look, I, I think obviously at a city level we all realise the importance we need to um, um, do infill housing and, and intensify, and obviously the impact of that is felt at a um, community level, and it's really important that we put in um, parallel process as this... Um, if this advances, um, to actually um, deal with some of those impacts. So I'd like to acknowledge um, Sarah's uh, amendment that's been included around the social impact assessment, because I think that's going to be hugely in important. Um, but I, I just think, um, and we just got to remember that the council in itself, we're, we're not above the law. Um, and look, the easy thing to do today would be to, to vote no. Um, and yeah, I'm sure you'll get a huge cheer from the crowd, and um, and it's great that people turn up. I, I also don't think that the the gallery is actually representative of the the people of Christchurch, and I also want to hear the voices. I want to hear the voices of the people that that rent. I want to hear the people of the younger people, voices of the younger people. I want to make sure that we have provisions in our city that last for 50 years for future generations coming through as as well. While I'm very concerned about the um, Enabling Act that's actually doing a, a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to Christchurch's um, ur urban planning, there's actually some very good things in here that will, will help the city actually be more sustainable in, in the future. But it's important um, that as these plans are put in place that Council actually work at what they can do to mitigate some of the, the impacts. But what, I guess, concerns me the most is if we vote no, there's that real possibility, a strong possibility, um, that a um, commission, a minister will be put in place, commission will put in place to actually notify this plan. And what will happen is all the qualified matters that have been put in place, that have been worked through through the feedback received by many people, um, will actually be disregarded. And therefore you'll end up having more intensification where we actually are trying to limit it as a council. So therefore it is unique for Christchurch um, and doesn't represent just an approach that's happening up in Auckland and, and Wellington. So look, look, I urge my 
fellow councillors to, to think twice. Voting no could actually have a much worse outcome for this, for this city than voting yes. Um, that's the reality. If you really want to protect the people of this city from intensification over the whole of the city, then don't risk losing the qualified matters that actually staff have worked hard to, to incorporate into the plan. Thank you. Uh, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to repeat what's been said. I want to acknowledge that um, people are impacted differently depending on their situation, and obviously it depends on what part of the city you're in. Um, and I want to you know, acknowledge the work of staff and also the residents who've made submissions on this. I also want to speak to those voices that we probably aren't hearing from, which are renters and people that can't afford to buy homes and are being shut out of the housing market. There is a silent majority of people that aren't being heard on this debate. And I think it's important and it's incumbent on all of us, homeowners or otherwise, that we consider that there are many people that can't get into rental housing and that there's a section of the market that just isn't performing for our residents. And we know that renters are residents and they pay rates. So it's important that we also take into account their needs, so I'll be voting yes on this. Um, Yanni? Thank you. Um, just wanted to start off by referring to an article that was written, How Mount Maunganui Turned From Paradise to Prison, which was a headline on a Stuff website article written by Max Christofferson a few years ago. He made reference to Mount Maunganui being destroyed by too much growth too much greed, too much development, too many subdivisions, too many people, and not enough land. He went on to complain that large councils have increasingly seen themselves as quasi-corporates rather than community gatekeepers, and that the development and growth continues with little regard for the loss of lifestyle. Many years ago, I also heard a radio interview with Dick Smith, the founder of Dick Smith Electronics fame. I looked up some information written about him, and some points he made resonates with me. These thoughts came as he flew a helicopter solo across the Atlantic in 1982. As part of the journey, seeing the world firsthand flying over towns, cities, farms and factories, he commented, Before people talked of climate change, I said I can't believe that we're not completely wrecking the world. Because as I flew most of the time, it was in smog or smoke, the amount of clearing that was going on, the huge cities, you could just see 5 billion people damaging the earth tremendously. He also noted an alternative to perpetual growth, is an economic system that values quality, not quantity, and that it should be about the quality of life rather than consumption. So I highlight these points to you as we consider the future, because post-earthquake we've already had much development for development's sake, with many greenfields across Christchurch being rezoned for additional housing. The urban development strategy that we did in 2007 made it really clear that people were against urban sprawl and people favoured retaining a green belt around the edge of the city with good urban design and with affordability, amenity, character and heritage being protected. I know we're in a difficult and dangerous predicament, but there are times in life where you must stand up for what is right. The increased enablement for higher density in this plan change is unlikely to give rise to the desired and necessary market shift to realise a more compact urban form. Further, given the required price points for apartments to become feasible, it's difficult to perceive uh, to foresee that private development market delivering substantially more affordable housing options. That's from our own report. This city has a proud legacy of having a strong social and environmental conscience and doing what is right. From Kate Shepherd to the nuclear free movement to the People's Republic of Christchurch, it is time to do it again. The right thing to do is not to notify this because there's widespread community concern about the impact it will have on the well-being of our local residents and that we have sufficient land already zoned to deal with what is being sought around housing affordability. Our board has also heard from the people who rent about the huge social impact that this intensification has on them. And it is not a positive, it is an absolute negative. Please support my amendment to write to the Minister as per my amendment to work in partnership to address housing affordability and sustainable development. I urge you to stand with the community and stand up to the government by not notifying this plan change. Sarah. Council is a creature of statute, and when we are sworn in, we make an oath. 
to ex execute and perform the powers, authorities and duties vested in or imposed upon us in a way that is in the best interests of the city. And that is what we should do today. Call me old fashioned, and people do, but I take my oath seriously. To simply vote against this because you don't like those duties is a fundamental misunderstanding of the role of council and risks further distrust in council by central government at a time where we want things from them too, including infrastructure funding and mass rapid transit. Our plans currently allow medium density in some areas without any incentives to keep trees or to add new ones, and we can change that today. We need to continue to increase density to address climate change and housing affordability. And let's be frank, the median house price of $690,000 is by no means affordable and to protect our productive soils from sprawl. However, areas like Rickerton have shown clearly what happens when areas intensify without the focus on trees, without mitigations like buying properties for pocket parks and without street trees and without enforcement on parking on berms. And that is on us, not the new rules. Council needs to invest in our communities and to provide amenity in the public realm and integrated transport options as we enable more affordable housing for those who currently do not own their own home. Today I put forward an amendment to have social and environmental impact assessments undertaken so that as a council we can support our communities as they grow. We must make decisions not only for current property owners but for all residents for now and for future generations. While the focus today has been on mostly the residential areas, I am actually excited to see the upzoning of the area adjacent to the central city between Morehouse Ave and Brougham Street, from industrial to mixed use. It will become a vibrant and bunky area within a walking distance of the city centre, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it develops. It is clear today that one of the only groups that will benefit if we vote no are property developers. Notification of plan changes by a Crown appointment without some of the proposed qualifying matters will give property developers more space to develop and lower costs with no financial contributions and no incentive to save or plant any trees, even if they have to wait a couple of weeks to do so. I fully understand the concerns of residents who want to maintain their sunny sections and veggie gardens. I have one, but voting against this today gives no protections and has significant potential to make things worse. Uh, James and then Melanie. We were only contending with a matter related to fighting the government's three waters reform model at the last meeting. Now we're discussing nationwide planning directives from government and the impacts it will have on the quality of life of our communities. We need to stand up and fight for Christchurch because this matters. Government thinks that they know best, but I'm sorry, our local communities deserve to be respected not roll with what's imposed on them by Wellington. I'm not opposed to higher density living, but it's got to be in, a, in appropriate areas, not copy and pasting planning rules nationwide and negatively impacting the quality of our residents' lives in the process. Parts of the central city make perfect sense for mixed use and higher density living. We're only halfway to our residential population target there, but forcing it in areas where families have specifically chosen to live for the very reason that it provides for a lighter density of living and it suits their lifestyle is quite frankly draconian. So we stay in the boat if we notify, we don't stay in the boat if we don't notify. I've heard that argument before. Case in point, three waters. We agreed to work with the Crown in good faith. The ability to opt out was promised if our determination was that it didn't work for our city and our ratepayers, but yet they mandated it. Working in good faith and staying in, in that boat led to the government sinking the ship anyway. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It's time to say enough is enough. Our communities need and expect us to stand up for them. I will be voting no to notifying this because it's straight out wrong, because our communities deserve us to send a strong message to Wellington, and that is that local and local communities matters, and the local and local democracy is imperative. Thank you. I don't believe that a blanket rule of allowing three storeys anywhere in this city is necessary. This government and our MPs have not been listening. Much of our community is frightened about the effect of three storey buildings next door to them, particularly in regards to shading. We all know how important sunlight is for our health and well-being. The fact that as a council we effectively need to rubber stamp these changes 
by notifying a plan change to our district plan is wholly unfair. It puts us in an, in an extremely difficult position. Not least, if we support notification today, we'll be, appear to be acting against the interests of much of our community. One of the major concerns around developments happening at the moment, especially in Addington, is about the loss of established trees on private properties in our suburbs. The concept of using financial contributions to encourage developers to either retain full-grown trees or plant new trees is the only method we have to prevent or mitigate the complete clear felling of trees in every single suburb of this city. Financial contributions would mean that if developers choose not to provide at least 20% canopy cover in 20 years, Council can at least squeeze money out of them that will effectively go into our combined ratepayers' pocket. And I am keen to see this Council push this further by requiring 25% tree canopy cover on developed sites, extracting more trees or more money out of developers. Please support my amendment on this today. I don't agree with the one-size-fits-all approach to our city. This council cares far more about its people than this government does. Do we bow down and let the government walk all over us, or do we stand up for what we believe in? I want to vote no, not to notify, to give the proverbial finger to the government and let them take full responsibility. I also want to vote yes to notify to try our best to protect our character and heritage areas and protect the trees in our suburbs. In 30 years' time, I don't want to see no trees in our suburbs. I don't want it to be the responsibility of ratepayers to fund trees in our public realm to make up for the lack of trees on private property. This makes the decision today incredibly difficult indeed. I've been swinging back and forth like a pendulum. On balance, though, I believe that the inability of the government to listen means it's incumbent on us to control this process. Let people have another chance to have their say and take money off developers who refuse to plant trees. It's the developers who make money out of all of us and let's not have, let them have the last laugh. Anyone else? Anyone else? Order, 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 please. Is there anyone else that wants to... Um, speak to this today? Andrew? I wasn't going to, but I will. Um, Christchurch isn't Auckland, um, and Christchurch does not need Auckland solutions for problems that Christchurch does not have. We have an opportunity today either to reject this outright, and that's what we've been asked to do by a lot of people sitting, a lot of the people sitting in the public gallery, and I've been taken aback by the degree of, of knowledge, the degree of passion, and the degree of, I think, anger probably would be the right word, that we've heard from submitters, and I've listened to that, and I've heard it. I want the best outcome for Christchurch. Um, I want Christchurch to continue to be the green city, the garden city, the city with heaps of trees, the city with open green space where our children can play and where we can go for a walk. Um, I don't want Christchurch to be a parody of some of the the worst developments that we see in other cities around the country. But I want us to remain in control of what happens in Christchurch as a council. I don't want somebody appointed that imposes on us a view from outside of this city. So whilst I've got every understanding of what's been asked for, and whilst I agree with the outcome that people are seeking, I, I want the green space and the trees and the, the sunlight as much as anybody else in this city does. Um, I think the way for us to achieve this is by remaining in control of the process ourselves. I want to see the qualifying matters strengthened to the greatest extent they can be. And there's been a huge amount of work done by council staff and by councillors and in the, the latest um, iteration of the resolution that's been moved and seconded as a result of the, the work that the mayor has done with, with staff as well. Um, I'm going to support strengthening those qualifying matters to the greatest degree we possibly can so that we remain in control of this process rather than giving it away. Anyone else? Right, well, I'll just um, close off the debate then. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, this is a hard decision for uh, councillors to make because obviously there are um, matters that have been imposed on us uh, and there are issues that... Uh, we all understand and, and consider um, unfair because, uh, that, because they have been imposed on us. This one-size-fits-all approach has been a challenge for 
um, for every single one of us, and we have made submission after submission. And as as we have said, it has largely uh, fallen on deaf ears. But the concern that I continue to have is that if we fail to notify at all, um, we will have central government appointing someone to notify for us. And that notification will meet the requirements of the legislation. It may not allow for the qualifying matters that have been set out by the staff in the recommendation that's before us today. Now, councillors are prepared, obviously, on one hand, to take that risk, and other councillors are not prepared to take that risk. And I'm lining up with the councillors that are, that are not prepared to take the risk that, that developers will get their way which ultimately won't require financial contributions if they don't retain trees or plant trees, um, because that goes with the package. The financial contributions is not an existing provision in our district plan. It comes with this plan change. So I have to support us holding on to the process because it will be worse if the council does not. And this is handing it on to the next council, but I'm afraid the government will intervene in the meantime if we don't. So that's that's um, the end of the debate. So if we could move now to the individual um, amendments. So uh, rather than... Um, could we have a division? Yeah, I mean, that's probably the easiest way. Yeah, so um, although I think some of the amendments will just simply be carried on the voices, so... Well, well certainly not with the, with the substantive, I think. No, 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 the substantive will definitely be a division, right. So, um, so the, the amendment uh, number seven has been moved and seconded, and that's request staff to make any changes necessary to the plan change 14 provisions to require... 25% canopy, um, uh, tree canopy cover on residential sites rather than 20%. So I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Aye. That was a very few saying no, so that's um, Kewan and Major. And... Um, so that is uh, carried. Then we move on to uh, the, um, uh, it's been moved and seconded McClellan Cotter that request staff to make any changes to um, plan change 13 and 14 to extend the Chester Street East Dawson heritage area to include, include all properties with Chester Street East addressed east of the current currently proposed HA2 boundary. Um, so that... Is there another one underneath that? that's a fail? No, look, that's... We, 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 there is an investigate one as an alternative, right. Yeah. Um, so, but that... Can we not... <laughs> yeah. We, we went through the list before, and the, all of the ones that had an alternative were advised to councillors. Why, why is that one crossed out? Is it because it's supported by staff? Yeah. 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 It's Mersey already Street. been moved. So can yep. we just deal with the amendment in front of us? Yeah. And that is the, is the proposed amendment 11, Councillor McClellan. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Um, so that's, hands up for those no. So that's um, Donovan, um, Templeton, uh, McDonald and Davidson. So that's, um, that's carried. That is carried, that, that, that one's carried. Um, the uh, 
The next one is to um, request staff to amend plan change 14 provisions that enable building heights around the Victoria Street area um, to be reduced from 32 metres to um, 20 metres. So it's been moved and seconded. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. That's carried. Kewan uh, and um, Templeton. Um, next one is Councillor Johansson. Uh, request staff to add to plan change 13 and 14 a new residential heritage area consisting of all properties of a consistent age with a wooden road address. <laughs> Um, that also has an investigation option uh, following it, um, if it's not carried. But I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Aye. That's... Okay. Um, just raise your hands. It's probably... Those in favour, um, put up your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's... <coughs> Tied vote. So, uh, Catherine. Catherine. <coughs> I'm in favour. You're in favour. Yep. Yep. Nine. Sorry. Um, okay. So that's carried. Any against? Yeah. Oh. Does anyone want to be vote, uh, recorded as voting against? No. Um, and uh, the next one is the uh, that Councillor Johansson, no, sorry, request staff to investigate adding the Upper Rickert and War Library to the schedule. Oh, no, that's that, that yeah, that's an investigate one. I, I don't think that there's a problem with that one. No. Eh? We, we can incorporate it into the main resolutions. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, Councillor Choose uh, requests staff to amend the PC14 identification of properties that are subject to the Rickton Bush interface qualifying matter to include all of those recommended by staff and also the additional ones there in Kahu Road. Um, that's been moved and seconded. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. Show of hands. Those in favour. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, carried. Um, and then we um, next we one. We don't need those, those, they, they, they were all of the alternatives. So that's all of the amendments. Um, and so uh, what I might Sorry, do I, now... I had, I had an additional amendment as well. Yeah, well, we haven't got to that yet. Oh, okay. Can so, we just... Cool. Um, so there are... There's a number of amendments which are the, those investigate ones. So if we could go... Because, I mean, just to get on the record that there is support for these. Mm -hmm. So if we could go 8A, 9A, 10, 12, 13, 16, 17, 18. Carry on. What, um, okay, so we've got all of those. Um, so um, they, they've been moved and seconded. So they're all of the other ones that came up by way of amendment that have been incorporated into the main main resolution. And to confirm, it will include the um, number 15. The, the one you've moved up. One. Yes, that's right, number 15 as well. So, um, so I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. And then we'll go back up and we've got, um, so we'll deal with number one separately, which is the public notification of Plan Change 13 Heritage, um, which is uh, separate from the Plan Change 14. 
So I will put the um, motion for the public notification of plan change 13. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Um, and just looking to staff for advice, but I think we, we need to determine the... Um, uh, oh, actually, did, we didn't do the 2.1, did we? No. So um, could, I, could I just test the, the council's um, uh, willingness to add the um, limitation to the extent of the area by way of making a submission, which is what we've done with the other amendments? Um, so I'll put that separately. Um, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And now we'll move to... Um, 2.2 yes yeah that's uh, that's the whole of that um, section sorry yeah and then we'll go back to sorry uh, look at, yeah can you go back down sorry I'm, I do apologize but you know there's been a movable feast here so we've got um, Request staff to amend the PC14 identification of properties that are subject to the Rickett and Bush interface qualifying matter to include all of those properties identified in blue on the following pan in 11 C Kari Street. So that's the addition to the recommendation referred to by um, Catherine Chu and her one. Um, and then request Environment Canterbury to undertake an urgent review of public transport coverage in light of the requirement to notify Plan Change 14 that, that isn't an acceptance of notifying Plan Change 14, it's just an acknowledgement that there is a legal requirement to do so. So um, I'll put that motion, th those together. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. No, Pauline? No. Celeste. No. Celeste. Celeste. Right, so then we go um, back to the notification. Is that right? That's the last yes, one, isn't it? Yanni's oh, got Yanni's, Yanni's got. Um, I'll just bring it up that is when you deal with it, perhaps after the same. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think we'd do the vote on the. We'll do the vote on the on, on the two. other on the notification. So this is approved. The public notification of plan change fourteen housing and business choice and its associated evaluation point, as included and attachments to this report. Um, and you know, subject to the amendments that have been made. Um, so, do we do we need to actually say um, is included in attachments to this report and amendments made to it, and and amendments made in yeah belts and braces amendments made in this meeting. I, mean, I, I just want this to be in the best possible condition if it's going to go to a to a um, someone appointed yeah. by the government. I want them to at least see what, what we did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So um, we won't call this. We'll just do this one by way of um, division. Division. So for resolution two, Councillor Galloway. Councillor Johansson. No. Deputy Mayor Turner. Yes. Councillor McLennan. No. Councillor Major. No. Councillor Goff. No. Councillor MacDonald. No. Councillor Keown. No. Councillor Cotter. No. Councillor Davidson. No. Councillor Scandrett. I'm going to abstain. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Coker? No. <laughs> Councillor Templeton? No. Councillor Donovan? Yes. Councillor Chen is not here. The Mayor? Yes. That's one, two, three, four, five, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 
against and one abstention. Thank you. Right, I declare that lost. <laughs> and um, uh, I think that under the circumstances, I think we'll um, uh, close the <laughs> meeting. And um, do you want to do right. item 15? Yeah. What? In my amendment? Yeah. Oh, I think it's a bit late now. <laughs> Yanni? Cool. So I'd like to move that the council write to the minister expressing its concern with this legislation and process. Uh, and two, that the council request the minister work with us in partnership to remove Christchurch as a tier one city, given our unique situation, that means we have sufficient capacity of land in the short, medium and long term available for housing, given our extensive land use planning changes to increase density and intensification post earthquake, and to um, develop a bespoke process with council as part of the Urban Growth Partnership to look at land use planning that addresses the issues of housing affordability and sustainable development. Sarah. So my understanding is that um, the tier one city status um, gives us access to a range of other things and isn't just about this particular piece of legislation. So for example, our tier one status is what um, obligates us to have um, our transport emissions cut through the Ministry for Transport's emissions reductions plan and those kind of things. And I'm just wondering if um, the member would be open to the other stuff that's in the letter, so just but without removing us as a tier one city, because there are other things as well that we're tier one infrastructure funding, <coughs> mass rapid transit, well, all of those a, things yeah. that we wouldn't so, get. Fair point. But so, we could work with us in partnership to develop a bespoke per process with council given our unique situation, but just yeah. take out the removal of the tier one. Yeah, I think you could just put the ISPP, which is the uh, um, streamlined process instead of tier one. Um, and you can remove us, you know, from this particular process or whatever. But I yeah. think the tier one city That's is fine. really you important for a range of it. other things that we want to do. Yeah. Do you want to change it to remove Christchurch as part of the IP, the ISPP? Or the MDRS or... But it's, yeah. Um, but I think the, the yeah, reason that I'm just going to exercise a little bit of caution here is that the Urban Growth Partnership is a partnership with Waimakariri and so on, and they are tier one because of the um, the incredible growth. And um, so I'm, I'm just... Uh, Do you want to just take reference to the Urban Growth Partnership out yeah, yeah. Um, and just um, just I have removed Christchurch as the IPSS? Look, we, we literally can't walk away from our neighbours when we're discussing intensification and the impacts of urban sprawl. We literally can't. I mean, I thought that was the point of your intervention earlier, was to actually identify that the urban development strategy has been existent, in existence for a considerable period of time, and that some of the consequences... Okay, no, cool. I'm urban, happy to leave it in. We can you, have a bespoke district. So, yeah, I, I'm happy to just have it, leave it in, if you guys are cool with it. That's what I would have thought would have been logical is we've got an urban growth partnership with central government and with our neighbouring councils for Greater Christchurch. No longer trust us. Yeah. So that to me yeah. seemed the most sensible thing to do, but if people have other ideas, I'm open to it. I do think, though, given what we've just done, we should be writing to the minister expressing concern mm. um, and giving I'm some... Sure I think he's got that be expressing, <laughs> expressing his concern the other way around. So, um, well, that doesn't mean we no shouldn't express ours. with writing to the minister... But I don't want people to have an assumption um, that uh, that this is going to, um, yeah, that yeah, that there won't be other impacts on um, relationships yep. as a result. Damn, so right. um, that the council write to the minister expressing its concerns with this legislation and process. Um, why, why don't we just say that the council is the, the, government that the minister out. to work <laughs> with us in partnership to... No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm taking this the next line. Um, so we'll leave, leave it the way it was. Yeah, that's right. That the council requests the minister to work with us in partnership um, given our unique situation. So just take out, remove Christchurch as part of that, given it... Um, The 
government could just direct the next council to do it, and if they don't, put in commissioners. Easy. Unique situation in having sufficient capacity of mm. Yeah, that means we have sufficient capacity. No, no, that, that works. Um, and uh, <coughs> if you start to yeah. look at the land use planning that addresses the issues of housing affordability and sustainable development and take out the EGP, yeah. because they can't do that in isolation with just one council. Yes, I know, but yeah. we're not going to get a bespoke process that, um, <laughs> unless we're walking away from the Urban Growth Partnership, and we can't actually do that um, as part of this process. So, um, why, why, why don't we just simply um, take out the de developer bespoke process for council as part of the Urban Growth Partnership? So you've got. Um, that the council requests the minister work with us in partnership, given our un unique situation, blah, blah, blah. Um, um, yeah. Yep. So d is that okay? Just, d just to put it all in, in one very long sentence. That's fine. I mean, I think at some stage, though, you know, when we write to the minister, we do need to make it clear that the community concern that's been raised through this process, which you can do, um, around the stream, the impact of the streamlined process on us as a city and on our community. So as long as that's covered, that's the most important thing. Yeah. And actually, the, the, the pre, um, the, the earlier process um, around our district plan review um, really did set us up for... Um, some of the issues that we're still having to grapple with today. All right, so um, uh, that's been moved by Yani, seconded by Aaron Kewan. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. That is carried. carried. Um, uh, kia whakairia te, ta te tapu, kia wātia ai te ara. Kia Turuki Fakataha I Kia Turuki Fakataha I Homi A Hui A Tai I declare the meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you.